Hello, everyone. Welcome to the discussion on geography and disaster management for Maine's 2021. Now, as per the UPSC exam, you must have checked question papers. We saw this year slightly higher percentage of geography questions than it was asked for the last two to three years. And if you see the trend of geography questions, it is it is almost like on the expected line itself. Although we got just one question in industries, but it's more or less same pattern that was followed. Let's try to analyze, let's try to understand the kind of questions that were asked this year in 2021. You can see that there were 110 marks questions of what of around 110 marks that were asked in geography uh, compared to the last year in 2021 it was just 85 2019 85 2018 85 so it was consistently around uh, 80 to 85 marks that were asked in general studies paper one this year the percentage has been slightly higher the numbers is 110 but the pattern of question has remained almost almost predictable almost same it's not predictable exactly but then yes uh, it's not also very different from what the kind of question that were asked prior to it it's like for example if we divide the sections of geography and physical geography this year we had one question of 15 marks and uh, 2020, we have two, two questions, 19, two questions, 18, two questions, and uh, 2017, three questions. So we always expect one or two questions, not many, but one or two questions from the physical geography. So it was more or less expected. Then natural resources, there were two questions asked, right? The year of 25 marks. Uh, factors for location of industries in India and world, just one question. In fact, that is a bit surprise for us that only one question has been asked uh, in industries. Uh, then the major geophysical events. This year, there were so many questions asked, uh, you know, from the major geophysical events, like volcanoes were asked uh, that occurred in 2021. So total questions were like three questions, which have been just one or negligible because most of that gets covered in the physical geography this year specifically there are two questions that are uh, rather three questions which are asked from the geophysical phenomenon we'll discuss these questions and then uh, the basic geographical features and their location the locational basis on two questions of 25 marks so you get this 110 marks from geography in general studies paper one now let's discuss these questions one by one. Let's try to understand uh, what type of questions were asked, what were exact questions that were asked, and uh, how do we expect to handle these questions in exam? How are, how are we expected to handle these questions in exam? So a student who is taking mains for the first time, uh, it's a bit challenging always because first mains is a bit challenging you know, to exactly perform in the exam conditions you, got, you get just three hours to write so many, so many questions. Uh, plus, there's so much of information that one has to remember, you know, and, and, and to stay calm so that you can answer these questions properly. Uh, it's also difficult for people who have written mains two or three times, but then, but then relatively easy, right? And this year, the kind of questions that were asked, I felt... Those people who have practiced writing, who have done the writing, uh, this, they are always at an advantage. I know most of you, most of you would have taken a lot of tests and you know written a lot of answers. We presume so. And those who have written answers and have uh, focused on the tests, they were always at an at advantage this year. So let's try to understand questions one by one. Question number one. It's differentiate the causes of landslides in Himalayan regions and Western Ghats, right? Differentiate the causes of landslides in Himalayan regions and Western Ghats. Now, this is a repeated question. There was a question based on the landslides in Himalayas and uh, 
it has this question has been many times discussed within in the class as well and otherwise also that both regions have the higher slopes himalayas have a steeper slope western ghats have a steeper slope and both have witnessed the landslides recently frequency of landslides thou is higher in himalayas than in western ghats but both have witnessed a lot of landslides so what are the different causes of landslides for himalayas and western ghats so let's try to recollect points what are the different points that one can think of at this point because both as as i mentioned are the uh, having steeper slopes and then we'll come to the introduction part what what can be the introduction so the moment we we read about himalayas and we think about himalayas there is this one point about himalayas that comes into mind i read about himalayas that these are young old mountains these are young fold mountains and since they are young fold mountains one thing is very clear that they must be tectonically active isn't it tectonically active zones and tectonically active zones undergo frequent earthquakes they experience frequent earthquakes and because of the higher frequency of the earthquakes it can landslides can be triggered so do earthquakes trigger landslides yes earthquakes do trigger landslides so one aspect whereas western ghats western ghats have a steeper slopes no doubt the slope is quite steep here steeper slopes but they are old features right old features and do not experience earthquakes for that matter they are not tectonically active zones because they are far away from the plate boundaries so no they are not um, tectonically active so this is one point which is like the, from the physical geography we can understand this so first physical point the second point is again from the physical geography itself we can make out that the rock here in himalayas if you see the three himalayas greater himalayas middle and shivaliks if we compare the three ranges shivaliks experience more uh, landslides than middle and greater himalayas although landslides are there in all the regions but then more frequency is there in shivaliks why because the rocks are softer rocks so it is also got to something to do with the softer rocks because softer rocks cause higher percolation the percolation of water is relatively higher and even in the greater middle and shivalik middle and greater himalayas which is composed largely of schist rocks or metamorphic rocks there are few cracks there are few fault lines and through fault lines the water percolation does happen and that can trigger earthquakes so in short the percolation of water is more in himalayas whereas in western ghats they are largely metamorphic they are largely metamorphic in nature hard rocks so percolation relatively is less but then here most of the landslides can also take place or they do take place because of glacial activities there is a melting of glacier right glacial activities whereas in here it's mainly because of that heavy rainfall heavy rainfall that occurs in western ghats and landslides are slightly higher that too on the western slope of western ghats landslides are not very high frequent on the eastern slope of western ghats they are on the western slope of western ghats where the landslides are much more frequent so these are natural factors you know like uh, tectonically active softer rocks glacial activities and then heavy rainfall that we see in western ghats then the point is that if you if you observe this entire phenomenon entire region uh, like himalayan and uh, western ghats it's not only the natural factors this we keep saying and we maintain that whatever disasters that are taking place across the globe whether it starts with the climate change it starts with any change whatsoever any uh, disaster part 
remember that one point that the phenomena is natural it's accelerated by anthropogenic activities it's affected by anthropogenic activities and those anthropogenic activities are human activities needs a special mention here that we have to mention uh, the reason like how anthropogenic activities and what are those anthropogenic activities which have led to the landslides in the region so that includes now we are talking about human activities right human activities that have accelerated the rate of landslides in case of himalayas it's largely construction it's largely construction of dams roads and to a lot of tunnels roads road construction dam constructions we know the lot of a lot of uh, hydroelectric power projects have been sanctioned in the region now these uh, increase in the construction in the region the increase in construction in himalayan region have also increased the frequency of landslides whereas in western ghats the human activities largely are associated with the mining activities few years ago there was a committee also gadgil committee who suggested that right gadgil committee it suggested that the anthropogenic activities or human activities should be restricted in the western ghats includes that 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 will trigger deforestation and mining activities should be restricted and it was in 2011 12 when this committee had given its report to restrict uh, the, the, these human activities there if you remember you can also mention this part right that will also add some more credibility to your answer and these are factors that have led to the frequent earthquakes in the region and uh, uh, sorry uh, landslides in the region so out of these two like the out of two regions himalayan regions and western ghats we know that himalayan regions are anyways prone to more disasters because of harsh weather conditions uh, because of you know earthquakes that we have mentioned and also now another anthropogenic activities that has triggered that higher landslide is deforestation now how do we start this topic with what what can be the introduction first of all one of the easiest way to start an answer is give the definition of landslides so we'll start with the definition of landslides definition of landslides that it's a type of mass wasting mass movement right with that includes the rapid fall of debris or weaker rock particles along with the gravity right along with the gravity so this is how we define a landslides and generally in the landslides the water content is higher when the rainfall is very heavy or there's more percolation of water under the surface that can trigger landslides so this is one way that we can simply start this topic and also one point one additional thing that we can we can always add to our answer is if we can present a map right present a map showing some of the landslide prone areas of india right some of the landslide prone areas in india that includes And that is this eastern parts i mean the himalayan regions northeastern region and the western part of western ghats so that makes a considerable around 12% of area of india that is prone to the landslides so we'll mention that and and towards the conclusion in the conclusion you should mention some solutions to that like we have a and national disaster management authority guidelines for restricting the landslides here that understanding the landslide and taking some corrective measures one of the simple measures that we can uh, suggest here is afforestation afforestation can be done on a large scale it can be a 
compensatory forestry, it can be uh, a part of agroforestry, it can be a part of community forestry or what we call as a component of the social forestry. And a forestry program can be started on a large scale because the roots of the trees, they hold the soil firmly and restrict the landslides. Right? That is how we can, these are some points that we can mention in this particular question. Let's go to the question number two, second question that was asked. Yes, and very interesting one. The question is asked and we need to highlight some important aspects here. Despite India being one of the country of Gondwana land, I just highlight this, Gondwana land, its mining industry contributes much less to the gross domestic production in percentage, right? It's mentioned in percentage and discuss. If the question demands discussion, discuss, that means, see, when you discuss a topic, you discuss all the possible dimensions of it. And you discuss all the possible dimensions of it. So, first of all, why has this Gondwana land been mentioned? This is very important to understand. And those who will understand this key point, you will you will be easy, it will be easy for you to address the question. First of all, answer for the question. Gondwana land. was the southern part of the Pangea, which split it, southern part, and India was a part of Gondwana land, right? Indian plate was a part of Gondwana land, we all know. Now, this Gondwana land, which, which, which part of Indian plate represents Gondwana land? It's largely the peninsular plateau. Peninsular Plateau that represents Gondwana land. Aravali, Chota Nagpur, Meghalaya, and the southern part is Kanyakumari. So, this vast area, this massive area of, of area of peninsular India is represented by the Gondwana land, the southern part. Let's try to understand that these rocks are very old rocks, right? very old rocks. The younger rocks are in Himalayas and the erosion of Himalayas, the Pleistocene period, we can see the formation of northern plains. But these are very old rocks and let's use the common sense here, very common idea that is when the layering happens, when the stratification happens, there are denser elements or denser minerals which are present at the lowermost part, like iron containing or metals which are in the lowermost part, then lighter elements remain layered over them, and the lightest remains on the top, like lightest, this is lighter, and this is denser. Right? Denser. So lightest on the top. Denser below this, the densest is at the lowermost part. That is the that is how the mineralization or stratification happens. That is a simple stratification process. Now, because the Gondwana land is a very old land, it contains these older rocks. Some of them are as old as Precambrian era. Well, Precambrian, which is of before 500 million years very old rocks. Since then, till now, lot of erosion has taken place. Wind, water, glacier, etc. They cause huge amount of erosion. So, because of erosion, what happens is, the upper lighter layers get removed, they get eroded, and the rich, rich mineral layer gets exposed rich mineral layer ex gets exposed. So, examiner asking this question that one of the countries of Gondwana land and then connecting it to the mining, it shows that Gondwana land must have lot of minerals and you understand that. Why mineralization? Why minerals? Because old surfaces, Gondwana land represents a very old surface and in the old regions, old surfaces, 
the richer or denser minerals are present which are which includes iron or metallic minerals etc right because upper layer gets removed with the process with the by the process of erosion over the time and 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 then older rocks get exposed because of these indian peninsula should contain because it's a gondwana land it should contain lot of minerals so ye key point hai you have to mention in your answers in the first one of the paragraph initial paragraphs that india being a gondwana land a part of gondwana land has huge mineral deposits because as due to mineralize as as the mineralization process happens due to the volcanic eruptions and many other processes right the gondwana land has undergone the removal of upper layers that has exposed old rocks they are also called as shield shield rocks and like like canadian shield brazilian shield african shield indian shield australian shield all these are mineral rich so every shield rock which represents the rocks of pre cambrian era are mineral rich this you will understand so by just mentioning this point you will mention that they are rich in metallic minerals and you don't have to mention keep uh, where do we have metal minerals whether it's chhota nagpur karnataka goa no just mention about that because this it's a very general indication the second point that you will write here is because it's very old gondwana region in the gondwana period which is very close to the carboniferous period of the geological time scale or generally the gondwana period there was huge coal deposits coal formation so peninsular india is also rich in coal deposits the gondwana land that indian represent india represents has a rich coal deposits why because the faulting has happened the faulting has triggered and and there there's lot of lot of changes that have taken place over a period of time you don't have to pause explain the process of coal formation just by mentioning this it will be clear that the region also has huge coal deposits because in the gondwana period or in the carboniferous period there was huge coal formations now that will show how rich is the peninsular plateau in terms of resources clear so first paragraph should be very crisp full of these inf this information then second point is contributes now second it, it's mining industry contributes less in gdp in uh, gross domestic production and so on if you if you know this it will be excellent it will be very good uh, that mining sector mining sector contributes roughly around 2 to 3% to indian gdp right mention this point so that means resourceful hote hue bhi despite being resourceful it doesn't contribute too much to the gdp reasons for that now we'll hit the issues related to mining sector issues related to mining sector there are ways to address these issues you can divide uh, divide these issues in uh, you know headings different headings for example we can divide this into various headings for example economic problems social problems ecological issues political issues right for i i'll just start with some of these issues say economic issues many times uh, mines that we see it's difficult to extract mine because of the very high investment cost involved in the mining sector investment for any industry is a backbone right it's very important so investment cost is very high moreover there is also an economic loss why because some illegal practices illegal practices like rat hole mining rat hole mining that is the banned in india 
but it is still being done in regions of Meghalaya, in, in regions of uh, you know, Northeast, it is still being done. So that is also an economic loss. Then next sector, next aspect, if you uh, associate with the social aspect, so look at the mining regions of India, which are the mining uh, regions of India, Chota Nagpur, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, uh, parts of the, you know, Karnataka, Meghalaya, these are tribal regions. Now this gives rise to, because they are inhabited by tribal issue, uh, tribal uh, population, this gives rise to a lot of other issues such as tribal resettlement. The tribal resettlement becomes a massive challenge. It's a big problem because tribals are not only associated with a culture, but they also have a very strong regional affiliation. So they have a strong regional affiliation. Therefore, they cannot be shifted. They cannot be uh, resettled easily. So this can lead to a massive tribal uh, displacement. Ecological problems. Ecological problems. Again, all these mine-rich regions are also densely forested regions. Right? Densely forested regions. So we we either have to remove the entire forest cover, that will also be problems, there will be ecological problems, or then mining cannot be done in every part of the region, which even if it is mining, even if it's a mineral rich region, right? So densely forested region, there's a problem. It leads to a lot of loss. Besides that, also the release of harmful gases. Harmful gases. And then the mining industries have to pay higher compensation and a lot of other issues are there. Then political issues. Political issues like local population opposes. Right, there are some oppositions, the problems like what happened in Nyamgiri in uh, Odisha. Locals did not allow bauxite mining in Nyamgiri, or for that matter, in many other parts, there are a lot of resentments and, uh, among the population. They do not allow the mining in a region. So, that is how the mining sector has been lessened. Based on that, there's also one till 2019. There was lack of composite licensing, especially for coal and gold bed methane. Lack of composite mining license. Right. Composite mining licenses was not there, which is not like a uh, private sector, especially, does not find it uh, easy to extract the mine same place we find coal same fine place we find methane as well so coal bed methane we require different licenses to extract coal and we require different license to extract coal bed methane so in, in, effectively the mining sector did not flourish so much there is also one of the reason Deco, there is one reason which may we may ignore. So these are some of the problems associated with the mining sector because of which the contribution of mining, despite being India, India being so resourceful, has relatively lesser. It is not only, it, it's actually a relative. This you can also write. That GDP contribution is always a relative. So it is not just the mining sector, it's other sectors like agriculture service sector that have significantly increased that not even agriculture significant increase in the service sector so relative contribution of mining sector seems to be lesser right seems to be lesser that is one of the main reason okay so these are points that you can include in this particular topic but key lies here and key lies in understanding the major mining issues is in India. Then the next question is, what are the environmental implications of reclamation of water bodies into urban land use? And example, expand with examples. Now, first of all, environmental implications. 
there are so many urban areas. I'll just cite few examples so that we can address the question. A lot of urban centers which had which had so many water bodies like lakes or wetlands. Later they were converted into urban centers by making it concretized and so on. So environmental implications, the first environmental implications, loss of biodiversity. Isn't loss of biodiversity. Right? Or oh, we know the wetlands are known for biodiversity. Rich flora and fauna survives around the wetlands. So this is loss. Second point, second environmental loss is increasing rate of increasing rate of urban floods. Increasing rate of urban floods. Why increasing rate of urban floods? That's because of concretization. Because of concretization, the land surface is made hard, so water percolation doesn't happen, and concretization uh, stops or, or it prevents the water percolation because of which there's an increased rate of urban floods. Also, other environmental implications is the continuous contamination. Contamination of such water bodies, whatever are left water bodies. So more urban landscapes will lead to the flushing out of waste, industrial waste and urban waste into whatever water bodies are left in those areas. Examples for this. Like the poor bill. The poor bill in Assam, in, in Guwahati, in fact, there has been a very high level of biomagnification, the incidence of biomagnification in, in Guwahati, right? Then and, and eventually the loss of biodiversity. Examples like Bangalore. There were so many wetlands or lakes in Bangalore which were converted into urban landscape and that has led to the immense loss in biodiversity again and frequent uh, urban floods. Now this will also increase the conversion. There is no particular example but a general idea that with the increase in the concretization of the surface, this has also led to formation of urban heat islands urban heat islands because the more gray surface or if we have more and more of uh, you know darker surfaces the absorption of light is more, absorption of sun rays is more and then heat heating is higher so temperature of these areas which have got converted into an into an uh, a concrete surface, an urban uh, a concretized surface have a relatively higher temperature referred as urban heat islands. Now, this is a major problem that we have seen over the years decrease. And if the surface area, like there's also one of the major problems that we are witnessing in most parts and, India, and that has pushed India into a state of water crisis and that is depletion of groundwater depletion of groundwater. Why depletion? Because if the percolation doesn't happen, the recharging of groundwater doesn't take place. And groundwater, therefore the water that is that is that is withdrawn at, in the urban areas is full of contamination, full of chemicals, harmful chemicals, and that is creating problems in the entire region. So core issue hai deal karna hai. Now how to come up with the solutions for this like we have this concept of spawn city we can use that spawn city where we can use this soft engineering techniques creating wetlands increasing green cover in the areas in the urban areas increasing more urban forestry so as the percolation of water increases and the loss of uh, these uh, you know uh, water bodies can be compensated to some extent, right? 
that is one of the way we can um, and conclude the discussion with. Then let us go to the next point, next question. Okay, now to be very honest, nobody was prepared with, with such a peculiar question and nobody can be prepared for that. I mean, Aapne do char volcanoes par liye honge ek saal mein, but the question was so specific. Mention the global occurrence of volcanic eruptions in 2021 and their impact on the regional environment. Okay, we understand the impact of the regional environment, but specific question has been asked on the volcanic eruptions in 2021. And in a year, there are uh, around hundreds of volcanic eruptions. At least 50 of volcanic eruptions that keep taking place in a year. We know that it's a continuous process. Right? But then still some points need to be like we since the question has been asked, and I always suggest this to everyone that even if you are not very sure related to the to a particular question or you know to a particular answer. You don't worry, you just answer based on your knowledge. You trust your knowledge. You trust your information. If exact volcanic eruptions 2021, ke hai, we know which are the regions where volcanic eruptions are very common, very famous or, or very frequent. So first we'll mention a little bit about the volcanic eruptions right by giving some introduction about a volcano that it's a vent through which magma comes out and so on we'll, we'll write that one uh, basic idea about volcano and then we also mention that it is the pacific ring of fire pacific ring of fire where volcanic eruptions are very frequent. Frequent volcanic eruptions do take place along the Pacific Ring of Fire, which includes the western coast of South America, North America, eastern part of Eurasia, you know, these uh, Southeast Asian regions. Last year, in 2021, there was a massive volcanic eruptions in the in the Indonesian regions. There were volcanic eruptions in uh, in in Alaska. There were uh, in western coast of USA. There were volcanic eruptions in Iceland. Now, you remember all the volcanoes, don't worry, but you mentioned that most of the volcanoes do take place in the Pacific Ring of Fire, followed by some volcanic eruptions that take place in the Mid-Atlantic region, Mid-Atlantic Ridge, right, which is a part of, I mean, the Icelandic region is a part of that Mid-Atlantic Ridge itself, right, that we can mention that. In this, in this specific ring of fire, we can easily uh, mention some volcanoes in Indonesia, like Stingbuk, which was one of the major volcanic eruptions last year. Then volcanic eruptions in Iceland, right? Volcanic eruptions that took place in the in the, in the western part, and there are some hot spots. Volcanic eruptions in Mediterranean Sea, Mediterranean Sea, like Mount Etna, there was a massive explosion. Yep. So, two, three examples. I'm, there are 20 major volcanic eruptions last year. You can't name all the 20, but we can mention the regions of it. So, there were some volcanic eruptions along the Pacific Ring of Fire in Indonesia. They were in Mid-Atlantic Ridge, Iceland. And in the Mediterranean Sea, that is a part of mid-continental belt in Mount Etna. And besides that, there are some active volcanic eruptions which keep on taking place in the hotspot regions. And like Mount Stromboli, hotspot regions like Reunion or hotspot uh, regions like in Caribbean or Hawaiian regions, they keep on taking place. So, pehle up, like you will just mention this. Besides that, now... One line or, or one few lines about the mechanism. Why why this volcanic eruptions are very frequent here is because these are at the plate boundaries. 
right? These are along the plate boundaries. So you just in one line you can write that denser plate subduct, denser plate subduct, and those denser plates can melt along the Benioff zone. Benioff zone that can trigger volcanic eruptions. That can trigger volcanic eruptions. This is one. Volcanic eruptions are also frequent along the divergent plate boundaries. Mention divergent plate boundaries. Right. Magma comes out. So in, in one paragraph, just compile everything. So we can compile all these things in just a paragraph that convergence and divergence happens and that can lead to the volcanic eruptions. Now, a tricky point here. To show these volcanic eruptions, some of you can also draw maps. And some of you can also draw maps to show that. But I would suggest that you should be drawing a decent map. And if you are, if you can draw a decent map, that will be very helpful to save some time. Right? To save some time. Right? So, so that you can show this on the map, the regions where volcanic eruptions have been very common last year. Right. So, this is the Pacific Ring of Fire region. The Pacific Ring of Fire region. This is region number one. Another part of that is on the western part of Americas. It's the Pacific Ring of Fire. Right. Then here in Icelandic region, the volcanic eruptions here with region. And third region is here where volcanic eruptions were common in Mount Etna. You can name regions. For example, here Indonesian coast. Eruptions here, Icelandic region, there were eruptions, Mount Etna, there were eruptions. Besides that, there are other regions also where volcanic eruption is quite famous, like quite, quite frequent. So, you can compile some map rocker. Sakte. Then the question is again very uh, tricky one and, and their impact on the regional environment. Of regional environment, the question has been asked on the regional environment. That means what could be the effect on the regional environment? And I'm sure while preparing for the mains examination, you must have read about bit about climate change and read, read about this uh, Karkato explosion in Indonesia, which was a massive explosion, and uh, you know the ash, etc., or these uh, cloud volcanic clouds were suspended in air for such a long duration of time, and and that. That, that blocked the sun rays and temperature reduced. Right? There was a decrease in temperature. So, exactly in the same way, you start from here that what is the effect on the regional environment. So, we can remove this now. First is release of gases. Right? Which can be a Negative aspect as well because a lot of methane, a lot of carbon dioxide, these gases are released. Second negative aspect that it can decrease temperature. It can decrease temperature regionally. The decrease in temperature is because of the cloud cover like dust particles covering the atmosphere and that reduces the sun's uh, solar radiations and temperature decreases. Right? I mean, it can be on positive and negative front both. But first is negative, then it is positive. What else can we think of this, this impact on the regional environment of, of, the, of, a re, uh, of a volcanic eruptions? See, sometimes volcanic eruptions can also cause a lot of other problems that include 
द फ्लो लावा फ्लो लावा फ्लो एंड कैन ऑल्सो ट्रिगर सेकेंडरी डिजास्टर्स सेकेंडरी डिजास्टर्स एज एन दे कैन ट्रिगर सुनामीज दे कैन ट्रिगर यू नो दीज वॉल्कैनिक इराप्शन कैन ट्रिगर लैंड स्लाइड एज वेल और अर्थ क्विक्स देन वॉल्कैनोज हैव अ पॉजिटिव कॉन्विटेशन एज वेल द पॉजिटिव एस्पेक्ट वन इफ यू टॉक अबाउट द मिनरलाइजेशन मिनरलाइजेशन राइट एंड ऑल्सो इट रिलीजेस द ह्यूज अमाउंट ऑफ प्रेशर रिलीजेस ह्यूज अमाउंट ऑफ प्रेशर एंड देर फोर कैन बी कॉल्ड एज सेफ्टी वेल्वस सेफ्टी वेल्वस राइट दिस इज द इंपैक्ट ऑफ वोल्कैनिक इराप्शन ऑन अ गिवन रीजन द एनवायरमेंटल इंपैक्ट is largely associated with the gases decrease in temperature and also some other disasters can be triggered by the process to conclusion mein aap likh sakte hain besides these impact on the climate on the on the local environment volcanoes also play an important role in the mineralization and they act as safety valves to decrease the pressure that develops internally राइट right? एग्जाम्पल्स भी देख सकते हैं आप यू कैन ऑलवेज टेक इन एग्जाम्पल एग्जाम्पल दैट हैपन दैट्स ऑन द रीसेंट एग्जाम्पल बट देन यस जोग्राफर्स आल्सो रिलेट इट टू द लिटिल आइस एज राइट बिकॉज इफ क्लाउड कवर इज देयर फॉर सो मेनी डेज और इट रिमेन्स रिमेन देयर ऑलमोस्ट फॉर टू इयर्स द टेम्परेचर डिक्रीज बाई टू डिग्री सेल्सियस सो टू डिग्री सेल्सियस डिक्रीज इन टेम्परेचर इज अ कंसिडरेबल डिक्रीज इन टेम्परेचर right so that can trigger other uh, environmental impact so can decrease the temperature release so conclusion mein hum ye mineralization ya safety valve wala point likh sakte hain that showing the positive aspects of volcanic eruptions okay let's move on to the next question why is india considered as a subcontinent elaborate your answer Why is India considered as a subcontinent? First of all, we need to understand what is a continent. Nothing to write an answer. You don't have to write in answers. Continent. A continent is known or demarcated by its large geographical area, large geographical extent. right geological diversity geological diversity right it's then climatic diversity diversity and if if there is a geological and climatic diversity this will also be low there will be also be a plural and faunal diversity plural and faunal diversity obviously there will be uh, rich biodiversity as well so the, this is generally a continental feature and lastly lot of countries the the so many countries which involved in which are uh, included in a continent but first to first three points are very very essential to demarcate any region as a continent so subcontinent so india is not a continent but it's a subcontinent uh, all those features that are seen in continents are also observed in indian subcontinent that is the main point that we need to describe so i'm removing this let's come to the push question up this should run through your back like that that should be in the background that yes these are this is these are the conditions for demarcating a continent first if you look at india indian plate has a very distinct right a distinct boundary right it's it has a distinct boundary indian plate and also has a 
distinct movement that is towards northeast no other country has a particular boundary right except australasia or it was indo australian plate now indian plate is separated moving towards northeast so first is geological aspect second a very wide range of geological diversity that prevails in india what is that geological diversity rocks of pre cambrian era rocks of pre cambrian era there are rocks like in dharwar region of karnataka or you don't have to give specific example but a general idea that peninsula represents geological uh, i mean rocks of pre cambrian era there are rocks of cretaceous period cretaceous period and deccan plateau is an example of this mention that cretaceous period without volcano there's a largest volcanic plateau in the world and also it represents rocks of tertiary and and the pleistocene age so almost all all eras geological eras are represented are found in india so very wide range of geological diversity besides that there is climatic diversity there is climatic diversity why climatic diversity how do we say it's climatic diversity because we have the driest i mean india has the driest place right one of the driest places of earth and one of the wettest places on earth place on earth it receives a heavy rainfall and it, there are also drier areas so there's a wide range of climatic diversity like if you move if we one moves from the southern part of india towards the northern part so there are equatorial equatorial and tropical regions whereas in himalayas there's a polar climatic condition there's a polar climatic condition so from from equatorial areas to the polar climatic conditions this also has a wide range of climatic diversity and the impact of the this physiography of india the impact can also be seen on other countries on other countries such as nepal sri lanka bhutan myanmar so the impact of indian physiography or impact of uh, the climatic diversity is also seen on these other nations other countries so india has therefore the features of subcontinent so ye raha physical aspect ki baat so here we can justify this based on the physical aspect in geography we always mention physical aspect yes but also anthropogenic activities are all are, are to be considered we have to consider anthropogenic activities as well and what are these anthropogenic activities right the human activities isn't there a huge range like for example racial stock of india a very diverse racial stock of india right racial stock very diverse there are nagritos as per the archaeolo uh, as per the anthropological survey of india or for that matter some anthropologist india has nagritos Neg uh, you know mediterraneans paleo mediterraneans mongolites australites or proto australites nordics dravidians so a very wide range of racial stock is also seen in india and if we go by the sub divisions of it there are there are you know brachiosphels there are armenians there are dinarics so there is a very wide range of racial stock and that racial stock can be seen only in the continental regions plus plus there is also huge cultural diversity now it's 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 very obvious if you are talking about the geographical diversity geological climatic racial diversity there is bound to be a culturally uh, cultural diversity 
So culturally, this region is very diverse and that much of diversity can be observed only in our continental regions. This is why it is called as a subcontinent. But how do we write the conclusion? The conclusion may aapko ek, like what can be a point unity in diversity which is which is because of the mutual interdependence mutual interdependency these points should be in your conclusion that's diverse but yet mutually interdependent right interdependent on each other because of different resources and all that and that is that is what makes the indian region as a uh, diverse but still united unity in diversity concepts in the end so this is one okay let's move on to the next question and uh, this is related to Briefly mention alignment of major mountain ranges of the world and explain the impact on the local weather conditions of with examples. So, even in this question, it is alignment of the major ranges, major alignment of the ranges and explain their impact on local weather conditions. Impact on local weather conditions. So, first of all, a क्वेश्चन ही डिमांड कर रहा है कि आप मेजर वॉल्कैन आई मीन फोल्ड माउंटेन्स या माउंटेन रेंजेस का नाम बताएं अलाइनमेंट ऑफ मेजर माउंटेन्स अलाइनमेंट व्हाट व्हाट डस इट मीन इट मींस अ डायरेक्शनल अलाइनमेंट इट मींस अ पोजीशनिंग ऑफ दिस माउंटेन रेंजेस इन द कंटिनेंट बिकॉज़ अलाइनमेंट कैन आल्सो बी द पोजीशनिंग एंड आल्सो द डायरेक्शन ऑफ ऑफ दिस माउंटेन्स so let's first as understand this aspect and then we'll come to the explain the impact on the local weather conditions right so to show the alignment one of the easiest way is that we'll present with the help of a world map right you should draw the world map or you should draw these maps wherever necessary Sometimes what happens is that we draw so many maps and we try to fit in the map in general studies in every question. It is also not advisable. We believe that you know one should draw map wherever it is required, right? So, for example, in this particular question, the the question demands mountain ranges, right? Alignment of mountain ranges. So you can't show the mountain ranges alignment of mountain ranges without representing it on the world map. So some of you have to practice now drawing a bit of world map right? and don't worry you don't have to draw like a cartographer right it's not it's just that outline representation should be there showing some major continents of the world and major regions of the world right this is suppose North America South America this is African region. Right, Arabia, Arabian Peninsula. This is Indian Peninsula, Malaya Peninsula, parts of China, the Kamchatka region. From here, this is Mediterranean region, Greece. Right, the Iberian Peninsula, the Jutland Peninsula, Scandinavian regions, and you can join here. Greenlands, all these Sumatra, Bali, Java, Lombok, Borneo, some islands you can refer, you can show, and then Australasian region, right? So these are some aspects of world map that you should not be missing upon. If you remember some major places, good enough, right? If you can represent some major places, good enough for that. Okay, let's let's show the world maps. I mean, alignment of major fold mountain regions of the world. So these are some of the major fold mountain regions of the world, which is looks like a parallel range to Pacific Ocean, including Rocky Mountains here. Then there is Andes along the western part of South America. 
southern part of Europe, there is this mountain range called as Alps. Northwestern part of Africa called as Atlas Mountains. Northern part of India, Himalayas. So we, we're just showing the young fold mountains of the world, right? Just the young fold mountains of the world. So here you can write about these are young fold mountain of the world. While mentioning this, you'll write that alignment of these. So after after having uh, presented this map or showing the redistribution of these major uh, mountain ranges of the world, you'll write that mountain ranges mountain ranges are located along the plate boundaries along the plate boundaries some mountains mountain ranges rather some ranges are almost parallel parallel to the coastline to the coast or to the oceans like rocky and andes like rocky and andes besides that rocky and andes uh, rest of the mountains are parallel to the plate boundaries or related to the plate boundaries so you can relate now you need to write one more point here once you have written the, this point when you have, once you have mentioned that they are at the plate boundaries you should also write one more line that the forces or processes required for the formation for the formation of mountain ranges for the formation of the mountain ranges is intense along convergent plate boundaries convergent plate boundaries that will suffice the need the forces which are responsible for the formation of these mountains are at the plate boundaries so you must mention this particular point you should write about uh, this this particular point here right now we local climate. Let's talk about local climate. But before we go to the local climate, you also mentioned there are some old fold mountain ranges also, like Appalachians, like Aravalis, right? Like these Brazilian highlands. Just one or two names because they have not mentioned, they have not asked only the young fold mountains. The question is about the major mountain ranges of the world. So it is a mountain range, although it's an old mountain range, right? Old fold mountain range. Aravali is old fold mountain range. So here in the next line, you will write a little bit about that there are few old fold mountain ranges also. Mountain ranges like Aravalis, Appalachians, or Brazilian Islands. Such mountain ranges are not aligned, are not aligned at plate boundaries, are not aligned at plate boundaries. Right? You should mention this point as well. If the question was all, only on the young fold mountains, then the question would have been the answer would have been much easier. But since it is old fold mountains, so uh, I mean, it's just the fold mountain, so we need to give a reference to the old fold mountains as well. Then comes the next point, next part of the question, their impact on the local weather conditions. Point to understand is weather. It's not the climatic condition. It's not that ice formation, weather conditions, day-to-day -day changes that are associated with the mountain ranges and obviously it's very local so what weather condition does one can think uh, or comes to the mind when we talk about the weather condition in mountain areas inversion of temperature mountain regions undergo inversion of temperature and that is specifically called as 
वैली इनवर्जन वैली इनवर्जन दिस वैली इनवर्जन ओपन लीड्स टू द फॉर्मेशन ऑफ लीड्स टू द फॉग फॉर्मेशन अलॉन्ग द वैली देन सेकेंड पॉइंट इज दैट देर आर लोकल फिनोमिन लाइक माउंटेन ब्रीज where the cold air what is mountain breeze the cold air descends from the mountains right cold air descends from the mountain breeze uh, from the mountains they are called as catabratic catabratic whereas warm air warm air rises that's called as anabatic so warm air rises from the mountain slopes anabatic valley inversion similarly mountain regions also cause orographic rain right it's because of mountains that it results in orographic rains and uh, along the along the windward side mentions this along the windward side and also can lead to the formation of some warm local winds for example fan for, for example shinook for example zonda right all these are the local winds which are formed in the leeward side of a mountain like along the leeward side of the rocky mountains the chinook along the leeward side of the alps there is fawn along the leeward side of andes there is zonda so these are some impacts of the local climate usually mountains higher we go cooler we feel with the increase in elevation the temperature decreases but that becomes a part of climatic expression the polar type of climatic condition not the weather conditions these are the frequent weather changes that are brought by mountains right so this brings us to the next question although this is also repeated one right this is also a repeated question how do the melting of ice arctic ice and glaciers of antarctic differently affect the weather pattern and human activities on earth very difficult to arctic and antarctic differently affect the weather patterns let's discuss this first of all we should understand one point that is the arctic region and antarctic region both are glaciated regions right both are glaciated regions but arctic region is largely oceanic whereas antarctic is largely continental so there are oceanic glaciers here continental glaciers in antarctica so by the basic understanding of heating process etc we can understand that antarctic is relatively colder than arctic region relatively colder than arctic region so first we'll see how the there are different conditions in the both in antarctica and arctic region the impact of climate change is very much seen in arctic then in antarctica or any other part of world there is a survey which of conducted by europe in european commissions that the maximum impact of global warming is observed in arctic region especially svalbard in norway they say that the temperature temperature is increasing at 4 to 5 times higher 4 uh, to 5 times faster 
then average then average so jitna average temperature baki jagah pe increase ho raha hai rest of the earth there is a four to five times increase in temperature faster increase in temperature in arctic ocean and therefore there it is it is experiencing climate change in a very different way in a very much more intense way than antarctica or other areas right so this is first part now how are they impacting the weather patterns or weather patterns of the world first of all there was a question asked in exam many years ago like there was i think in 14 or 15 the question was asked about cryosphere what is the role played by the cry cryosphere so first of all the albedo is higher right on snow the reflection of sunlight is much higher now albedo of antarctica antarctica is greater or higher than albedo of arctic now with the higher albedo more of most of the light is sent back sunlight is reflected and therefore temperature is regulated to some extent so out of the two regions antarctica plays a major role in regulation of temperature because it reflects relatively more rays than arctic region because arctic is oceanic antarctica is purely continental and has a more ice cover then arctic the significance of arctic ice is not just related to the albedo but also very much related to the rich methane or methane calcite that is present present in arctic region melting of arctic will really uh, melting of arctic ocean can release can release huge amount of methane huge amount of methane in atmosphere and that release of methane can trigger climate change whereas in antarctica there is no such methane accumulation under the under the ice cover so under the ice cover of arctic there is huge methane if we remove that ice cover if it melts that methane gets released and can can increase the climate change and can increase the global warming ye arctic ocean mein difference antarctica mein aisa nahi hai besides that next point in arctic region you know the arctic region will play an important plays an important role in polar vortex heating of arctic or warming of arctic region disturbs the jet streams disturbs the jet stream the sub polar jet streams and polar vortex polar vortex can cause more damage so because of the weakening of this uh, polar vortex because of weakening of sorry uh, the the jet stream sub polar jet stream the polar vortex moves out of arctic region and can cause lot of destruction in the lower areas this is another significance another aspect associated with arctic region where is nothing such happens in the antarctic region so to see both are important the point is arctic as well as antarctic both are very very significant but the main point is uh, how are they different from each other so antarctica right like arctic region both have a significance in regulating but the impact is more on a more uh, related to the weather directly on the arctic reach right this is how melting sorry how melting of arctic ocean has an influence on different weather patterns in the world right recently of very recently there is a discussion on north atlantic meridional overturning circulation north atlantic meridional overturning circulations these are the normal thermohaline circulations right these are 
thermal haline circulations where ocean currents move from equator they subside at around subpolar regions now they subside this this water sinks to the lower layers and and comes out from the equatorial areas because of higher salinity and because of because of higher salinity and because of low temperature because decrease in temperature will increase higher density so the water density increases and it sinks and comes back again but melting of arctic adds fresh water fresh water fresh water will decrease will will decrease salinity it in fact decreases salinity decrease in salinity decreases density decrease in density decreases intensity of thermo haline circulations circulations so those northern north atlantic uh, circulations or ocean currents are getting weaker because of the weakening of the thermo haline circulations and why is it happening is because salinity is reducing so the decrease in salinity is decreasing the density it is rather decreasing the density of water and the entire circulation is getting weaker what will what is the impact on the weather conditions european weather european weather conditions are getting harsher during winters and decrease in rainfall and decrease in rainfall so in europe because the north atlantic circulations are not that intense so rainfall is less moreover the winter conditions are getting harsh because north atlantic ocean is very important to increase the weather condition like uh, normalize the temperature conditions in european conditions right so ye impact hai arctic ocean ka melting of arctic ocean on the local climate uh, leading to polar vortex in european climate getting harsh in european climate uh, decrease in the uh, rainfall and moreover also having an impact largely on the climate where the release of gases methane can trigger this and moreover uh, can can increase the intensity of global warming and moreover the release of uh, red albedo is very high discuss the multi next question is discuss multi dimensional implications of uneven distribution uneven distribution of mineral oil in the world multi dimensional implications on uneven distribution of mineral oil in the world okay we know that the mineral oil is not equally distributed because it is not found where we where do we have the uh, higher distribution of this generally in the offshore regions mention these regions like persian gulf right like persian gulf right gulf of mexico gulf of mexico regions like venezuela lake maracaibo besides that i mean these are rich in petroleum like oil well also in northern part of europe north sea and then northern part of russia these are mineral oil now what are the multi dimensional implications of uneven multi dimensional implications you have to divide the answer in various headings because we are we, because we are discussing the multi dimensional impact that multi dimensional impact can be first of all the social aspect 
economic aspect right ecological aspect to some extent but political aspect political aspect now you have to relate which one should be the first should it be the social aspect or economic aspect think on your own because we are talking about offshore oil wells and uh, it's a it's a, it's a resource so obviously the first point has to be about the economic implication what is the impl economic implication the economic implication is that these regions are high per capita income regions high per capita income regions and can also which is a positive aspect but also can lead to inequalities 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 such as some countries like you can take an example of yemen Yemen has very low human development index in West Asian countries, whereas Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Kuwait, they have higher because Yemen does not have rich oil reserves. That is one of the one of the examples. Then economic aspects is that controlled by prices rather prices are controlled by few countries few countries like opec countries they decide the fuel prices and sometimes can lead the world into crisis it can it can lead the world into oil crisis or energy crisis example what happened in 1960s, uh, late 1960s and 1970s, 72 and subsequently till 1978, when oil prices were increased from $1.7 a barrel to $28 a barrel. Right? That was the first energy crisis that world witnessed. It was because the oil pricing was controlled or, or because oil is not present everywhere oil is present only in few countries so opec countries use their discretion to increase the oil prices and eventually led uh, problems in developing countries country like india which was developing stage had to spend a huge amount of its revenue its its revenue in importing oil wells this is one of the economic implications now so this is positive, but there are negative implications as well. The next aspect will relate it to the social aspect. Social aspect. You know, last 2019, there was a report on migration from India. And it was said that most of the migration in India from India takes place towards UAE, Saudi Arabia. Kuwait, now, nearly 22% of Indian, 22 million population of India went to Kuwait, uh, first in UAE, Saudi Arabia, and almost 16% of the total migration took place in Bahrain and other areas also, not in US. So US is not the first destination of uh, Indians. Why? Because these are oil economies. And in the countries where, you know, the skill development is relatively less it invites huge amount of migration so you can observe migration to oil rich countries especially west asia social implications can be positive negative this is mineral rich it can also lead to some cultural conflicts right that is that is an associated problems of the uh, social issues, right? Social aspect. If there's migration, that can lead to some social uh, impacts, right? <clears throat> then let's talk about next aspect. What about ecological aspects? Ecological implications. Ecological implications. First, spills. Oil spills. There have been some dreadful oil spills 
because of the extraction and if you look at the oil spill percentage most of the uh, oil spill percentage has been because of the leakages and transportation like leakages and the transportation of oil tankers and quote few examples here like gulf of mexico right gulf of mexico there was a severe biodiversity loss like loss of corals because of oil spills oil forms a thin layer of uh, over the corals and corals suffocate to death because of the uh, i mean these oil spills then second point associated with it is that with the petroleum extraction or when we drill the oil drilling of oil drilling of oil reduces fertility of soil reduces the fertility of soil also causes contamination of groundwater contamination of groundwater this is also so so it remains unfit in the regions where oil is extracted it is unfit for any settlement ecological implications right besides releasing the harmful gases in atmosphere the drilling of oil releases harmful gases release of harmful gases in atmosphere that ecological aspect and lastly the political implications there are geopolitical implications geopolitical implications what are geopolitical what do we mean by that it's like you see the opec countries when opec countries were formed so oecd was also formed apart from that you would see those conflict zones because these are new geopolitical heartlands and the presence of oil in the persian gulf a rich uh, uh, oil of, uh, in the persian gulf led to the geopolitics or geopoliticization of indian ocean so much so that india had to move a resolution in un uh, indian ocean as a zone of peace right that is one of the reason why we have so much of geopolitical uh, you know heartland it has become a geopolitical heartland is because of the oil wells present here this can also lead to a lot of political and economic issues like what happened in venezuela there was a increase in the uh, growth like the oil production but as the prices declined the economy of venezuela suffered that also had a political implications in venezuela this is what are the different social implications that we can think of in this particular question now this brings us to the last question that was asked in upsc 2021 mains this one is from industries what are the main socio economic implications arising out of development of it industries in major cities of india now again it's very tricky one socio economic implications of major it industries in india so the focus is on social changes the focus is on economic aspects first of all we should understand what do we mean i mean this it industries which are the major it industry cities of india it zones of india and whenever you think of it bangalore right hyderabad right uh, gurgaon right then also kolkata chennai right chennai so there are regions where you can see these are some major it industries of india and it flourished 
the socio-economic implications. First of all, all the IT industries, there's huge amount of migration, migration in such industries, in such cities rather. And cities become cosmopolitan in nature. Cosmopolitan in nature. Right? Diverse industries, uh, diverse population. Right? So, cosmopolitan in nature. Then, uh, so far as the migrational uh, aspect is concerned, this is a positive one, right? This also can lead to the conflicts. The negative aspect is the cultural conflicts that can take place. And this is like that son of soil. So, the, there have been cultural conflicts in the region because of the, in these cities, because of the migration, because of huge population migration and resources. Plus, one more negative aspect that we can see because of this migration is that resources are burdened. Resources are burdened. Right? There's huge pressure on the resources. Right? Plus, although the positive aspect is also there that it leads to the Increase in skilled workforce, right? Increase in skilled workforce. This is one one plus point. Also, the skilled education because of these IT industries developing in in, in different parts of uh, India, the skilled education is is better it increases the overall literacy rate overall skill development increases in a region these are aspects associated with the so social aspects now economic aspects related to the major it industries or it cities in india that includes the cost of investment investment as in the land cost increases the land cost increases for the development of infrastructure because there's a huge demand of the infrastructure and the land cost keeps on increasing right but the positive front the positive aspect is that these it industries also support a diverse range diverse range of industries diverse range of industries like other industries are also dependent upon it industries it can be manufacturing industries because we are talking about industrial revolution 4.0 so in in the context to industrial revolution 4.0 it industries have a very very important role to play okay so these are some of the aspects that we can relate to So, you can see these questions asked in this year's geography question papers. Now, let's move on to disaster management. Although we got two questions this year from the disaster management, General Studies paper 3, uh, 2021, total marks 25. Last year there were 15, 2019 there were 25, 18, 15. 17, there were again 15 marks which were asked. So, again, expect it. It's not something different. 2019, there were 25 marks asked in disaster management from disaster management point of view. And 2021, also 25 marks. So, now the question is how this trend goes on. Like two questions in 2021. One question 2020, two questions, one question one. Now, if you see the past few, again, this is again expected. And you expect one or two questions. 
right? We expect one or two questions in this from the disaster management, right? And January is paper three, and I would consider it as an expected one. Question that was asked: Discuss about the vulnerability of India to earthquakes. Right, earthquakes related hazards. Give examples including the salient features of major disasters caused by earthquakes in different parts of India in last three decades. So it's more like the case study of earthquakes that have major earthquakes that have taken place in the past. Right, you have to mention that what was the I'll discuss what are the different aspects that we should include in the case studies. First, let's come to the first part of the question. It is about discuss the vulnerability of India to earthquakes. Whenever we discuss disaster, the vulnerability is always considered. It wasn't the case previously. Previously, any disaster was defined or disaster map was formed uh, or drawn based on the number of events that have taken place, based on the number of earthquakes that have taken place or, or any disaster that have taken place. Now we also consider vulnerability. Now what it means by what do we mean by vulnerability? It is the chance of exposure of a population to any disaster, to any disasters. That is vulnerable. A population is getting more vulnerable. How does vulnerability increase? Vulnerability increases with more construction, right? with more construction like specifically the construction of dams, right? Because, now next we can write that dams trigger reservoir, I mean earthquakes which are called as reservoir induced seismicity. We'll quote few examples later. In next part of the answer, we can, we'll quote examples where it has a mentionable salient features. So, Reservoir induced seismicity with more construction vulnerable. It is not the earthquake, but the chances of exposure, chances of earthquake will increase. Next point with increasing population density, increasing population density. So, understand this point it is not that increasing population density will cause earthquake. But increase in population density will increase the chances of destruction. More and more people will come under the influence of earthquakes. Right? More and more people will come under the impact of earthquake if there is more construction because more buildings can collapse. So the collapse of more and more number of buildings can trigger, uh, can, can cause more destruction. So Mercalli's scale or intensity of earthquake can be higher. So, this is about the vulnerability of India to earthquake related hazards. Moreover, the disaster, right, if, if you look at the hazards or disasters, are defined as when the vulnerability, vulnerability meets the event or hazards. When vulnerability meets event, that is a disaster. So, it, in defining any disaster, any hazard, vulnerability is also one of the main criteria. So, this is what is the introduction for the particular question. Then, smartly you can draw seismic zones in India because it is about the vulnerability of earthquakes and no more earthquakes are defined just based on the event. They are also defined on the basis of the number of the, the vulnerability. So, you can present a map of India, right? You can draw the map of India.
and show some regions where vulnerability is slightly higher. Right? A rough idea about Indian uh, map. So, seismic zone 5. Seismic zone 5. Northwestern part of Himalayas and northeast. Rest Himalayas in seismic zone 4. Northern plains, seismic zone 4. Run of Kutch region, seismic zone 5. Maharashtra, northern part of Maharashtra and Gujarat is in seismic zone 4. Surrounding regions are in seismic zone 3, seismic zone 2. Here in Andaman Nicobar, seismicity is very high. So, seismic zone 4 is the zone where the vulnerability or rather the chances is much higher. Like frequency of earthquake and vulnerability is higher. So, you can draw the, you can draw a map and divide India, divide or, or show seismic zones, seismic zones of India, right? Various seismic zones of India, right? Seismic zones. Then mention about some, we'll come to the case studies later. But one point, remember there is, in, in here itself, you must mention there is no seismic zone 1. There is no seismic zone 1 in India because the vulnerability has increased with the more construction and higher population density. So as the population density is higher, vulnerability is higher, the seismic zone, seismic zone uh, is, is also like gone up to Two, it is there is no seismic zone one. Although there is no, there hasn't been any any earthquake. Luckily in Kerala, Tamil Nadu, or Telangana, or Andhra Pradesh, but still they are in seismic zone one. Vulnerability has increased because of more population density and construction. Coming to the second aspect, it's like major disasters or major earthquakes that have taken place in last three decades. So some of the major earthquakes. Latur earthquake in Maharashtra, Bhuj earthquake in Gujarat. Besides that, prior to that, Koina earthquake in Maharashtra. It was now here Bhuj earthquake and Latur Latur earthquake in Maharashtra. They are because of the faults in the western, southwestern part of India. Why? Because Indian plate is going eastward, so that is why a huge fault lines. Earthquake in Koyla in Maharashtra was an, is an example of reservoir induced seismicity because of, according to seismologist, it was because of the in construction of this Koyla reservoir. And Koyla reservoir has led to the, uh, you know, increase in concentration there. Then comes the next aspect, next example, uh, very recently or a few years ago, we had this Nepal earthquake though, it did not, did not have much impact in India luckily, but the northern parts of India did experience earthquakes. Then earthquake in northwestern part of Himalayas, earthquakes in northwestern part of Himalayas in the Gilgit region, right, here there was a Mm, epicenter was in the northwestern in the Pakistan occupied Jammu and Kashmir region and from there earthquake did take place as well. It was a massive earthquake that took place in 2005. Right? Nepal earthquake in 2013. So these are some major earthquakes. We can go on. Like in 2020, 2020 there was an earthquake in Assam. Luckily there wasn't much the the Impact or disaster was relatively less, but there was an earthquake in Assam uh, because of the Scopely Fault, which is a part of the Scopely Fault, is a part of Himalayan Frontal Fault because it's a plate boundary. So, all the regions that are plate boundary are seismic zone, seismically active zones. So, you must mention these earthquakes and how do we prepare the case study? You regions. The regions first, 
epicenter then cause as all other cause all other uh, you know these uh, earthquakes like nepal earthquake northwestern part of himalayas or for that matter this is because of the plate movement it is due to tectonic movement but bhuj latur faulting koina because of reservoir induced seismicity so these are that is what you need to mention about cause plus what has been the effect as in the disaster impact what has been in that region by earthquake so this is how it has happened in different parts largely himalayas uh, the gujarat and northern maharashtra region and these are two major regions where earthquakes have taken place then again a question on landslides it's paper one and paper two both uh, landslides have been asked describe various causes and effects of landslides mention the important components of landslide risk management strategy right so various causes and effects of landslides which is like academic and then rest you can easily manage with the landslide risk management so first jappi up whenever you mention the cause first think about natural cause of landslides natural cause of landslides the natural cause of landslide can be softer rocks right softer rocks or permeable rocks permeable rocks so that water percolation happens in the deeper layers next reason for the landslide is of course presence of water in sub layers plus gravity presence of water in sub layers plus gravity right that causes that has a that flows along with the slopes cause now sometimes what are the other causes like earthquakes and other disasters other disasters can trigger the secondary disaster such as landslide so sometimes earthquakes and avalanches can also trigger landslide so they act as a secondary uh, disasters besides that anthropogenic factors like deforestation deforestation right overgrazing and mining activities can cause you know at least especially uh, can cause landslides especially in himalayan regions you can also mention anthropogenic activities such as construction construction of roads use of dynamite etc which weakens the rock and trigger frequent landslides all these factors combine ab effects landslides ke kya so effects of landslides the first effect soil erosion right that is the negative aspect soil erosion loss right of right economic loss economic loss although with the landslide it doesn't look like very huge but it's like 0.02% of the uh, you know this schemes or gdp is spent on the disasters uh, overall in in these himalayan areas mainly caused by the landslides landslides can also trigger sometimes can also trigger uh, huge waves like tsunamis can also trigger glacial lake outbursts these glacial lakes if if this uh, if there's a landslide can generate these bigger waves or huge waves and those huge waves can move out of the 
glacial lakes and can cause floods. So glacial lake outburst floods can also be caused by these landslides. So there is an economic loss. So I mean soil erosion, economic loss. There is secondary disasters are you know, those disasters which are triggered because of the landslides can be tsunamis at times and glacial lake outburst that can lead to floods. Then we come up like National Disaster Management you know, uh, Authority comes up with this National Landslide Risk Management Strategy. The strategy, they go, Jabbi strategy ki baat hai na, to strategy mein kuch basic points hote hai. Like understanding the landslide, understanding the cause of landslides, understanding the impact of the landslide, and understanding the remedial measures for the landslides. Ye char components hai. These are four components of this land national landslide risk management. Right? So first, understanding the landslides, then cause of the landslides, impact of the landslides, and mitigation effect of the landslides, which you can easily answer by reading this, which, which comes in 2012, National Disaster uh, Landslide Risk Management Strategy 2012. What we observe this year, because very few questions other than this 2021 question that was asked, like how many, uh, what are those major volcanic eruptions in 2021? We do not see the current, very current questions. It is not that the programs of 2020 or 2021 have been asked this year means. So we should learn one point that, you know, our, our reading, our practice should be wide range. It should, it should have a, a very wide range. It should not be limited only one year of current affairs, but also having a, a you know, wide uh, information. The context can be because there are so many landslides. So we should prepare ourselves with the landslides. There are volcanic eruptions of question anyways has been asked. So prepare yourself, prepare for the mains, prepare yourself for any type of questions. Even sometimes when we do not know the questions properly, we still can write a very decent answer. And to write the decent answer, all that we need is how to present that information that you have gathered in on the piece of paper. Because when you take prelims, you gather a lot of information, you prepare for UPSC exam, you gather a lot of information, mains, you prepare for mains, you read a lot, you, you collect a lot of information. But the most important aspect, the most important aspect is how do you present your information in the given word limit in the mains examination. I wish you good luck for all the students who have taken mains this year. Wish you good luck. We'll, I hope you all of you get through and we'll see you in the main in the for the interview preparations. Those who are who have not yet taken mains, prepare yourself thoroughly so that you can these such kind of questions become very easy for all of you. Thank you and good luck again.